Hello there and welcome to the Strategy Strategic Analysis video for the Management Case Study Exam for the November 2021 and February 2022 exam sitting. Now in this video we're going to conduct the strategic analysis of Frinta, our precinct company, so that you have an idea of where Frinta currently is, where it is going and how it can even get there. And the whole point of this video really is so that you can produce more logical answers in the exam that make strategic sense for our pre-scene company. But before we get into the meat of the actual analysis itself, it'd be a good idea if we just remind ourselves of the case, who Frinter are and what they're all about. To start with, Frinter manufactures and sells central heating controllers and smart speaker devices. Now the heating controllers is its oldest product, whereas the smart speaker devices is its newest and where it is currently diversifying. It is based in the country of Westland with factories in Westland Central City and Tech City. Now the one in Tech City is 90 miles south of Central City. And it recently entered the smart speaker market as I alluded to, but it entered it in 2016. And it entered behind Epox with its Epox speaker. And Epox is the market leader in Westland with a 60% market share. The company is also quoted and must produce its financial statements in accordance with IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. So bear that in mind whenever you have to study for the exam as you will be applying or you will be expected to be able to apply International Financial Reporting Standards in the context of a quoted company. So how are we going to analyze our pre-seen company? Well, what we're going to do is use something called the rational planning model. We're going to use it to look at where Frinter is right now. Uh, what its current circumstances are, things like its business environment, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then we're going to look at its future. Okay, where, where does Frinta see itself in the future? What goals does it want to achieve? That sort of stuff. Now, there's no point thinking about the future if you don't know how you're going to get there. So the purpose of this model is to analyze the two and figure out how Frinta can get from its present to its future and what strategies are available to it, what risks it might face along the way. So to figure this out, we're going to start by looking at the future. And we're going to be looking at the mission and values of the organization, followed by the balanced scorecard, which we use so that way then we can tell how Frinter, how well Frinter is achieving its mission. We're then going to look at governance to see how it operates internally. We're going to look at its ethics and corporate social responsibilities, as many organizations now have a progressive way of thinking. And then we're going to look at its critical success factors, what is absolutely necessary for Frint to, su to succeed as a company. And then we're going to wrap up the future by looking at a stakeholder analysis using Mendelao's matrix. And it's always a good way to see what companies, uh, what the company's stakeholders are most relevant to it. Then for the present, we're going to look at a tried and true method, which is a Pestel analysis to get a grasp of the general business environment. We're then also going to apply Porter's Five Forces as a way of assessing how the broader smart device industry is doing and how Frinter might compete with other organizations or entities that are involved in it. We're then going to look at the value chain to figure out how Frinter actually creates value, the processes it goes through. And then lastly, we're going to go through, again, another tried and true method, a handy SWOT analysis to appraise Frinter's overall performance. With these two pieces to complete, we can then start looking at the generic business strategy. Starting with Porter's generic strategy, we first need to identify what Frinter's current strategy is. Using this information, we can then look at what Frinter's strategic options are using the Anzos matrix and decide where Frinter could develop its product in the market. But once we have these options, there's also the concern of how the business will grow. And Frinter needs to consider the ways in which it can stimulate growth and if it wants to achieve it's, if it wants to achieve its long-term vision, I should say. And then we'll wrap that up by defining what we believe Frinter's business strategy is and look at what Frinter can do to achieve it going forward. So, as promised, we're going to start by looking at future and more specifically, the mission for Frinter. Right, so what is Frinter's mission? Well, we go through a few steps. We'll start with the purpose. Why does the organization exist? For whom does it exist for? What does the organization hope to achieve? You know, this is the, the primary reason for why this business operates the way it does, okay? And quite simply, it's there to sell smart and easy to use household electronics. We can ascertain this from the business model in the pre-scene. You know, its whole purpose is to broadly speaking, provide smart household devices 
but there are also elements to it as well. Its purpose, potentially, its long-term purpose, might be to become an orchestrator in household smart devices. We've already got the Friend to Friend, which is supposed to be a sort of hub for other smart devices. So in one respect, its own product is analogous of it being maybe an orchestrator in the future. As for the strategy, so how will this organization compete? What will it do to beat out its main competitor, Eatbox? Well, part of it is to sell more powerful devices. Again, from the business model, we can see that part of the design aesthetic is that they're not only simple devices, but they're also very powerful devices as well. Things that can do a lot of uh, things for, for people that buy them, obviously. And they also got to be visually appealing as well. Part of Frinter's whole aesthetic is that these devices are luxury items, they look really good in the household, and they don't look out of place. So visual design is part of Frinter's strategy as well. As for the values, what does the organization stand for? Quality, value for money, etc. Well, they obviously want to provide high quality products. Again, the business model does reveal a lot about this for us, but we also see it throughout the pre-scene. Quality is very much at the top of Frinter's uh, business model, but it's also part of its premium product pricing justification. And then it's also the innovation. Frinter want to remain innovative. They started off with normal mechanical heating controllers, and now they've advanced into smart devices, which are infinitely more complex due to the software required to run them. And Frinter are looking to continue that innovation, which is clear from its purchase or, or its, its uh, new factory in Tech City, which would suggest that it's looking to acquire and hire maybe in quite intelligent, skilled individuals to help it innovate and continue to develop its products for the future. Then policies, how will it ensure that it acts in accordance with its values and strategies and purpose? Well, we've got one example of that, which is that its products, its heating controllers specifically, not its smart devices, must be easy to install. And the way it does this is twofold. So generally speaking, its products must be easy to install, okay? That is, that the primary value of, of its products is that people can buy them, install them, and they just simply work. And so if Frinter failed to produce products that achieved this primary goal for them, then they would be failing in, in the sense that they wouldn't be producing a product that uh, fully upholds the values and strategy that they're trying to accomplish. But the other thing is that they also want them to be safe. So in the case of the heating controllers, a specific policy that is mentioned in the pre-scene is that they must be installed by professionals. That is not compromised on at any point in the pre-scene from what we can see. So any product that it sells must be given to a professional installer who will then be the one who installs the heating controller. The friend to friend is slightly different in that because it's not a heating controller, that policy does not specifically apply. As for the next step of our analysis, we're going to be looking at a balanced scorecard. So this is a model that we use to analyze various financial and non-financial factors of a business to see how it is performing. And you can see we've got four broad areas. We have, of course, the financial perspective, which is all to do with the money that the business generates and how it spends it, so costs and profits and revenues, that sort of stuff. Learning perspective is all about trying to educate the staff, improve the uh, knowledge base that is within your staff, their skills, and also continue to innovate when it comes to its products or services. Internal perspective is primarily about its operational efficiency, so how, how, much, how many of the machines does it utilize, whether its employees are satisfied with the way in which the business is operating, that sort of stuff. And then customer perspective, it quite plainly, is about the customer. How do they feel about what Frinter is, is selling them? And are they happy with the overall performance? So let's go through these in a little bit more depth. So the financial performance, we of course have our profit figure. Naturally, if the business isn't generating a profit, a gross profit, operating profit most importantly as well, then it is not going to be sustainable. Frinter needs to make sure it recoups its costs and that it recoups them at a rate that it can continue to grow at. And so profit is a very important metric to analyze when looking at the balanced scorecard. There's also the variance analysis. As a manufacturer, it's quite important that Frinter conducts a variance analysis to ensure that things like material variances and labor variances are kept under control. We know that costs can play an important part in the business, that we have costing information in the pre-scene. So overall, variance analysis 
is very important to get right. Cash flow, cash is king after all, yes. Business needs cash, and as a manufacturer, it's important it has its working capital under control. And from the pre it looks like it does, it's got a low working capital cycle. Then as for the gearing ratio, obviously this relates to how risky the business is. If Frinter wants to uh, attract investors, then it needs to present itself as not being too risky of a business. And the gearing ratio is one way in which it can measure that level of risk. So that's the financial perspective. All of these are obviously financial financial uh, metrics that a business can use to assess its performance. But there are, of course, non-financial metrics, which is what the other three parts of the balance scorecard primarily accomplish. So from a learning perspective, as a smart device manufacturer, it needs skilled staff. So it needs to see how many staff it has that are skilled in particular areas of the business. Maybe it needs uh, key staff in software engineering, or perhaps it needs them in data analysis to measure the the user performance and what users are using Frinter smart devices for, for. It could be that they need to analyze that area of the learning perspective. New projects in development then, well, this has a few in implications. New projects mean that the business is continuing to look for new ways of innovating its current products, but it also means new opportunities for staff. Obviously, if you've got this skilled workforce, they probably want to be kept busy. And if you are not, if Frinter has not uh, got any new projects in development, then those staff are sitting around doing nothing. And it's possible that they're more likely to move on because they might feel bored. So new projects in development can be an important part of the learning perspective. And the level of team collaboration we saw in the pre-scene that we have two factories, the heating controller and the smart speaker factory that we don't know how close the two work together, but we do know they work with the R&D department, or it's most likely they do, as the R&D department is obviously gonna be important for the continued development of the Frinter Friend. So there's gotta be some collaboration between R&D and production if they wanna get the most out of each other's skill set. As for the internal perspective, well, again, efficiency is gonna be important, but also things like new business relationships. We know that Building business relationships is part of Frinter's long-term strategy as it's working with Dronku and it's moved to Tech City to again capitalize on the development of its business relationships. Going back to that strategy I mentioned a minute ago as well, we think Frinter might want to become an orchestrator. So this part of the balance scorecard might be an important part to measure. How many new business relationships is the business developing? How strong are they? That sort of stuff. Employee satisfaction as well is going to be key as you need to make sure the staff is motivated and that they have the creative license to develop. When it comes to software engineering, the development and innovation of new products, employee satisfaction is going to be incredibly important if the business wants to maintain motivation and of course maintain the creativity of its staff. Their machine utilization is a pure efficiency metric. If Frinter wants to ensure that its machines are being fully utilized for the manufacture of its products, then this is one area in which it can obviously measure when it comes to the balance scorecard. As for the customer perspective, market share is a big one. We are told specifically that Eatbox, Frinter's main competitor in the smart speaker market, owns a 60% market share. So being able to measure how effective it's taking the market share from Eatbox would be an indication to Frinter how well it's satisfying its customers. If it's losing market share, then it's obviously doing something wrong. And if it's gaining, it's doing something right. Number of complaints is fairly generic, but a good one. If the printer friend starts acting up, if it starts not responding correctly, or if a software update has created bugs that prevent it from functioning, then the complaints are going to be important to look at as ideally as a smart device. It needs to be as non finicky as possible. And the number of complaints is a good way of assessing how effective Frinter is at creating, most importantly, simple and easy to use devices. A hard and complex device to use by the general consumer is probably going to receive more complaints. And obviously, customer satisfaction. Frinter could try and send out questionnaires or surveys to assess from its key customers how satisfied they are with their products. Although this might be a little difficult to do given that they sell directly to retailers. So it may be that they'll have to use the friend to friend account that is mentioned in the pre-scene in order to achieve this. So that's the balance scorecard. The third area of the strategic analysis for future is governance. Now in the 
actual exam for a management case study, there is a specific assessment outcome called threats to good corporate governance. So this is important, but this is basically going to be a general overview of what is important to governance and how it might apply to Frinter. So what does good governance include? It includes a separate chairman and CEO. It has independent non-executive directors, an audit nomination remuneration committees, management, risk management focus, disclosures, financial reporting controls, information for the directors, that all directors are also involved in decision making, regular meetings, good use of annual general meetings as well. As far as the precinct goes, yes, there is we don't we aren't told that the CEO and the chairman are separate, but we are told there is a chief executive and that among the non-executive directors, there is a non-executive chair, so we do have at least independent NEDs. We aren't told about risk no uh, a nomination committee. Most of these features are just general uh, general things to be aware of when it comes to good governance that you might find applicable in an answer that requires you to understand the threats to good corporate governance. I mean, so you may raise some of these areas, things that the directors have to be involved in good decision making. And... We're told, actually, that when it comes to, say, pricing decisions, these are made by the board. So you could argue that they are involved in quite an important decision, such as the price of its products. Uh, but we are also told that Frinter aren't looking to compete on price, so maybe not as relevant. But still, we are at least given some indication as to how the board are involved in decision making. It's not like the chief executive is the one that is primarily responsible for making pricing decisions. It is the whole board, at least. So let's look at applying this now to the precinct, which we've already done a bit of already. So we do have a balanced dish board of directors. We have the five board of directors from the precinct, plus then we have the chief executive, David Jones, for a total of six. And we have the six non-executive directors, including the non-executive chair, who is Tamara Dagan. Now, we would expect that these non-executive directors do have wider business experience and they're able to review and check board decisions, that is an assumption I am making, though, I have to come clean about. Okay, that is an assumption. But for the lack of better information, I'm just going to assume then that, yes, these board of these non-executive directors you would think are appropriate, but they maybe are given some information in the exam that they're not. And so those would be threats to good corporate governance that you may want to bring up. We're also told that there's no remuneration, risk and audit committee, which we said is part of good corporate governance, or at the very least, we're not told about one's existence. It might be that these committees do exist, but for the sakes of the pre scene, this isn't deemed as relevant to tell us yet. Maybe in the exam, maybe not, just something to be aware of. And then, of course, along with those committees, there's no nomination committee. So, of course, nothing in place to no, no succession, no succession committee in place, I suppose, when it comes to replacing boards of directors. Now, while I've got your attention at the end of this video, I'd like to make you aware of the other products that Astranti sell as part of the case study course. So the first of these is a series of study text and tuition videos. And these come in two flavors. You have our written study text if you prefer learning through reading, or you can watch our videos if you're more of a visual learner. Now to start with, we have an exam technique study series, which breaks down how to succeed at various case study levels. We'll be looking at exam technique, writing style and planning that you need to nail to be successful in your case study exams. And to accompany this, we also have a revision series dedicated to the theory side of things. This is because at the case study level, there is a large amount of theory you need to be capable of using in your case study exam. So what we've done here is we've taken the key areas of the theory from the three case study levels and condensed them into a series of chapters to help focus your revision. Moving away from the more generic products and onto the products that are specific to the case study pre-scene, the first of these is the pre-scene analysis video series. First and foremost, this contains a series of videos where we break down the relevant pre-scene at the appropriate level of the qualification page by page. And throughout this video, we bring out all the key points that could be relevant for you in your exam, looking at various topics and things you might need to consider when revising for the case study. And then to supplement the pre-scene analysis, we also have two videos. We have the strategic analysis where we give a broad overview of what kind of strategy the pre-scene company is using and where it might be going in the future. And then we also look at the top 10 issues that we think this pre-scene company might be subject to and something that you may need to take into consideration when revising for the case study. We then provide an industry analysis document and accompanying video. 
Seema would like to see you demonstrate wider industry knowledge in your exam. And this is what this industry analysis does, as it gives you the wider industry knowledge you need in order to fulfill this requirement. Essentially what it is, it's a large document that we've compiled on all the relevant industry information that we have gathered so that you don't have to do the revision yourself. And then to accompany this, we of course have a video that goes over this document to pick out some of the key points for you if you prefer that. We also produce a number of mock exams for every sitting. We write five mock exams for the first exam sitting and then we add two more supplementary mocks for the second exam sitting. We design these mocks around the specific issues relevant to the pre-scene and make them as close to the real thing as you will see in the case study exam as possible. So these are a great way to practice your exam technique and test your knowledge of the pre-scene company under timed conditions. And then to add value to this product, we also offer a marketing and feedback service. So we have a range of highly skilled finance professionals working as freelance staff for us and it is these staff that provide the marking and feedback service. So this is a great service to use in conjunction with our mock exams as it gives you a great idea of how you're progressing in the areas you need to work on for your case study exam. And then if you're in need of extra exam practice we also provide a more generic question pack product. So obviously there are only so many questions you could write about on a specific pre-scene. So what this question pack is, is a series of generic questions on generic scenarios that we come up with at Astranti, whereby we look to test specific topics that come up regularly in the case study exam. So if there is a particular topic you are struggling with and we've only tested once in our mocks, and you'd like more practice on it, then these question packs will be a great product for you to turn to. The penultimate product on this list is a product for those of you who would like to get a full overriding picture in terms of your revision all at once, and these are our masterclasses. So these are our expert tutors who hold two masterclasses every exam sitting, and these essentially cover all key aspects that you're going to need to know for your relevant exams. So from particular theories to analyses of the pre-scene, all the way through to tips and tricks you can use in your exam. And finally, such is the confidence we have in the quality of our product that if you do purchase a full course from us and you unfortunately do not pass your exam using our product, then we will offer what we call a pass guarantee. So if you did not pass your exam after purchasing our full course, then you will receive the materials for the next exam sitting free of charge. Okay, thank you very much for listening to that. I hope you find our products useful. And of course, I would like to wish you the best of luck in your exam from everyone at Astranti.